We welcome you in the name of Jesus to this service of worship. Welcome to this service with the Presbyterian Church of Morristown. We're glad you will be worshiping with us. Please join us in the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? From our daily labors, the Lord summons us. Free from fear, we are bold to follow. God's holy light illumines our days and unshadows our souls. In God's light, we can see clearly through the eyes of faith and return gratefully to God's arms of grace. With hope and trust, then, let us unburden our hearts through our unison prayer of confession, which will be followed by a Kyrie and a time for personal prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, forgive us when we forego peace for easy resolution, when we trade justice for convenience, when we doubt whether you are real enough, whether we are good enough, whether your love is strong enough to overcome the destructive powers of our world. Forgive us, God, and move us to know your transformative grace. Amen.
Hear now our assurance of pardon. It is hard for us to believe or to understand Christ's great love for us. Yet the meaning is clear. Our sins are forgiven. Good morning. Have you ever been told not to look directly at the sun? You're really not supposed to because it can damage your eyes. So I brought some sunglasses and I thought, do you think I could wear these to look directly at the sun? Or maybe these aren't strong enough. Maybe I could try these. What do you think? Would these work? No, not even sunglasses this big would protect my eyes from the sun. It's just too powerful and too strong. So we've been traveling with Moses and Moses is still up on the mountaintop talking to God. And he is um, talking about God following along with the Israelites, with them on their trip to Canaan. And God is saying that, you know, he just needs them to go on without him. And Moses talks to God and says, please, we need you with us. So God agrees. God is really very close to Moses and he agrees with him and says, I will be with you. But Moses goes a little bit further and he says, I want you to reveal yourself to me. I want to be able to see you, God, with my own eyes. Well, we can't do that, right? We know God is too powerful, too mighty, too magnificent to see with our own eyes. And God wants to protect Moses. So what he does is he passes his glory. It says it passes his glory over Moses, but Moses has to be hidden away so that Moses can only see God's back as God walks away. So Moses isn't able to look directly at God's face. But God allows Moses to see his back. He finds a way to be with all of us with his glory and mercy without destroying us. But his face, his power will always remain a mystery to us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us on our journey through life. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your strength, which you share with us. Help us to come to you in prayer whenever we feel overwhelmed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With our children and future in our hearts and minds, we are pleased to announce the theme of our 2021 stewardship campaign. Our children, our community, our commitment. On Wednesdays, our church offers a midweek program for our kindergarten through fifth graders. And during that program, we have a Bible story, we have recreation, we have craft, and we also offer music instruction. We also have a partnership uh, with the Morris School District, and it is called the Morris After School Program. And in just a moment, you're going to hear from Jan Doherty, who is the co-coordinator with Shelley Troutman of this after school program that serves our first and second graders in the Morris School District. 
Thank you, Alexander, for this opportunity to share information about our tutoring program with the Morris School District. Our goals involve fostering a love of reading, an interest in learning, and a curiosity about the world. We also encourage respect, cooperation, and caring for one another. It's our eighth year of collaboration with the Morris School District. Monday afternoons following the school calendar, children uh, come by school bus to our church parish house, 65 South Street. Our sessions run from 3.30 to 6.15 p.m. The afternoon concludes when the parents sign out their child. The four sending districts of the elementary schools are Normandy Park, Alfred Vale, uh, Woodland, and um, Hillcrest. The strength of the program lies in the tutor-child interaction over time. We alternate grade levels. Uh, the children initially come to us as first graders, and whenever possible, return to us the following year as second graders. This provides a wonderful opportunity for child and tutor to bond. It also allows tutors and parents to renew their ongoing relationship each week at pickup time. When necessary, tutors act as a liaison between parents and the child's teacher. Each year, the children receive grade level reading and math workbooks to use during the school year. We also distribute summer workbooks. The 10 week summer format helps the child review and continue to learn reading and math skills. The books also provide tips for how a parent might help their child in summer learning. Our afternoon is structured. The children have a light snack when they first arrive, followed by a group activity that involves crafts, music, both uh, vocal and instrumental, or exercise. We strive to read a group story at each session. We provide a sit-down light supper, followed by an hour of tutoring with an adult. Our program offers many opportunities for adult involvement as a tutor, a substitute tutor, designer of uh, programs like the crafts, the music program, group story readers, serving snacks, providing a supper, or just coming on Monday afternoons. We plan to resume in-person tutoring January 2021 with our second graders. Welcome all. These compelling programs, our devoted clergy and staff, are brought to you by the generosity of our congregations, stewardship pledges, and contributions, and through gifts from members and friends. Over the next few weeks, you will learn how to participate in the 2021 stewardship campaign. Check your home mailbox, visit our social media channels, or stop by the website to learn more and to make a pledge via Breeze. We ask you to listen, to embrace, to get involved, and to pledge financially and to pray for God's guidance and direction. God bless. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, Paulus, Evanus, and Timothy. To the church of Thessalonians, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God and Father for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly. Remember before God and Father your work of faith and labor, of love and steadfastness, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with a full conviction. Just as you know what kind of people we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit so that you may be an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not on in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place where your faith in God has become known. 
so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions, report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Ernest Hemingway in A Farewell to Arms wrote, the world breaks everyone, and then some get strong at the broken places. When we left the children of Israel last week in chapter 32, they were at the bottom of Mount Sinai. They were caught in the act of worshiping the golden calf. Moses had found them, God had found them, and God got angry and broke the Ten Commandments. It's that moment when you find out that what you've done has hurt somebody. And in this case, it wasn't only Moses, it was God. And then they're supposed to leave Sinai and go all the way to the promised land. And I'd submit to you that at that moment, they were reluctantly going forward for a couple reasons. One was whenever you go into a new place, you're worried about the future. In this case, there were no roadmaps or GPSs. They didn't know how long they were going to be there in the wilderness. They didn't know whether they would be fed. They didn't know whether they would get water, even though God had done that before. And when they got to this land, supposedly flowing with milk and honey, would they have the wherewithal to conquer the land? They were scared of the future, so reluctantly they probably went forward. But I think they were reluctant for another reason, because they knew what they had done, and they were paralyzed because they had done something that had broken God's heart. I wanna talk about today this remarkable passage, which is the 33rd chapter of Exodus. And I wanna go back to the beginning of it because I think it holds together remarkably. I think there are three parts to this. One is symbolized by, I believe, the broken 10 commandments. The second is the tent of meeting, which is described and the last part, which was read today by Patrick, I think can be capsulized by the Ark of the Covenant, how God somehow works his way through the feelings he has about the people of Israel. The woman was 26 years old. She was sitting in her psychiatrist's office and her parents were there. She was 
trying to get her parents to take her home again. You see, she had been in rehab for drugs and alcohol four times. Those stays had almost bankrupted her parents. And every time she had gotten out, she had promised that she'd stop drinking, she wouldn't get arrested, she wouldn't drive when she was drunk. And each time she ended up in jail and back in a rehab center. So there she was trying to tell them, this time's different. I know I've broken your heart before, but this time's different. I won't do it again. And they want to bring her home, but they're worried. They're worried she will go back to doing what she did before. And they're worried about bringing her back because she's got younger siblings. And the last thing they need to do is see her fall apart again. Trying to forgive something that happened is really hard. And one of the things that happens in this powerful passage in uh, Exodus is that early on, God's heart is broken and it's clear. When Moses comes down off Mount Sinai, he breaks the Ten Commandments. And it's a way in which he shows his disgust with the people. But at the beginning of chapter 33, God is speaking to Moses and God is saying, you should take the people and go to the promised land, the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I'll send an angel because if I go, I will consume them with my anger. He's at a point where he's evaluating just how painful this has been. I know it can be difficult to project on God our feelings, but somehow this reminds us of how we feel. When something happens in our relationship and it's frayed, and we don't know exactly what to do, and it seems like the person's I'm sorry isn't enough, and our feeling of sadness and pain, and we haven't even begun to realize that, and it's hard for us to say, I forgive you. It's hard to forget those times. Back in the 1990s in South Africa, after apartheid was abolished, the government tried to do something to help people deal with the pain and suffering that came with that oppressive system. And people who had been harmed by it were allowed to come before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now this was a tribunal where, where people could tell their stories but unlike the Nuremberg trials after World War II, they weren't tracking down Nazis. There wasn't a whole lot to make their lives better in the sense that they didn't get um, money back or whatever for what had happened to them, but there was something profoundly important about people saying how bad it was, how difficult it was, how much the pain was of being in apartheid. I think at the beginning of chapter 33, God is saying, this is really bad, and you've hurt me. And he's wondering whether he can be with the people like he was before. The next part of this story is the tent of meeting. It's the tabernacle I spoke about last week, the tent that was outside of the camp, that every time the children of Israel moved to another place in the wilderness, they'd set up a separate tent of meeting. It was a portable church, synagogue, temple. And in the middle of it was the Ark of the Covenant, in which were the Ten Commandments, either the fragments or the second edition that Moses made. It is there that a debate takes place, and that's between God and Moses. And where God is speaking to Moses, Moses is speaking back and saying, we can't go ahead without you, Lord. These are your people, not mine. And it's that debate back and forth that God has to decide, as we all do, that when your heart has been ripped out, when something has torn you apart, particularly in a relationship, is that relationship worth fixing? Is the relationship God has with the people of Israel worth putting back together again? Because it's never going to be the same again. In 1964, I got to go and see at the World's Fair the Pieta, that beautiful statue which was created by Michelangelo in the early 16th century. 
Tradition has it that he used one piece of marble to create this incredible scene of Mary holding the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. It was gorgeous. In fact, it's the only piece of sculpture that he signed. I guess he found out someone wanted to take credit for it and he wanted to take credit for it and I'm glad he did. When I saw it at the World's Fair in 1964 when I was a teenager, I got to see it for a few minutes Back then, the technology was they stuck you on a conveyor belt and slowly I went around it and there was a bulletproof uh, uh, glass in front of it. And even from the distance I was from it, it was gorgeous. Eight years later in Rome, a crazed geologist with a hammer went after the Pieta. He hit it 15 times. He broke off Mary's left arm, whacked off her nose, and did all kinds of damage to it. That was by the time they finally took him away. The question the Vatican had was, do you fix it? Michelangelo had been dead for years. How could you fix his masterpiece? Do you just leave it the way it is, with a broken arm and no nose? Is the relationship worth fixing? After the affair, do you want to keep working on the marriage? After the friendship's blown up, are you ever going to trust him? And if you know that the people you called out of Egypt turned on you and worshipped a golden calf, do you really want to take them to the Holy Land? We have to decide whether we want to work on that relationship. That may be the thing we do in the tent of meeting. Now, the passage that Patrick read today is the end of this chapter. And this is where Moses makes this plea that God go with the people. And what God reveals to them, to him in that moment, is that his qualities are represented this way. That God will be known for his goodness. God will be known for his name. I will be with you. That God will be known by his graciousness and that God would be known with his mercy. I believe that the symbol of this is the Ark of the Covenant because inside the Ark of the Covenant was either the second edition of the Ten Commandments or the fragments of what Moses had broken up. And I kind of like to think about the fragments. That as they took the Ark of the Covenant through the wilderness and they heard it rattle around, it reminded them that God had saved them, that they had fallen, but it was his mercy that brought them back. That he believed that the relationship that they had with him and he had with them was worth saving. The people in the Vatican, you know what they did? They got together a group of people who were artists and craftsmen and they reconstructed the Pieta. They put her left arm up, they fixed it here and there, and eventually they had to reconstruct her nose because when the man knocked it off, someone actually stole Mary's nose. There's a place in hell for that woman, I know, or man. They had to decide whether or not the statue mattered or not. We have to decide if the marriage or the friendship or our relationship to God matters enough, and then we need to forgive. There's no way in the world we forget. Forgiveness is a choice we make because we know that something is broken and we're willing to try to put it back together again. It's never really the same. I've heard that for the Japanese, when they get an ancient piece of pottery and it's broken, they fix it. They use glue or whatever they do, but they make sure that where the glue is, is really profound. You can actually really see where it's broken. They don't hide it because they believe that it's more beautiful because it was broken and restored. It's got a history and so do we. The relationship that God had with the people of Israel was never the same again, but God was able to choose to love them in spite of that. We have to decide whether or not we bring the 26-year-old daughter home. We need to decide whether or not we keep with the marriage even after he broke our hearts. We need to decide whether or not the friendship is something we want. Because forgiveness is a choice. 
There's a story about a man and woman who've been married a long time and they were watching television and she said to him, talked about something that he had done a long time ago that really hurt her. And he was taken back by it and he said, honey, you said that all that was forgiven and forgotten. And she said, well, I don't want you ever to forget that I've forgiven you. God chose to love them in spite of what they had done. He chose to forgive them. You see, the world breaks all of us, and then some get strong at the broken places. Amen. Let us open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. Loving God, you are steadfast. You know us each by name and forever enfold us in your love. We trust that your presence goes with us, even when we cannot feel it. Show us again your glory and your goodness that we might find renewed energy, conviction, and passion for all you call us to be and to do as your disciples. May your spirit empower us to imitate you by receiving those who feel judged and rejected, by walking alongside those who despair, by encouraging those who tend to the broken, and by affirming those who labor in love. We lift into your tender care those whose bodies, minds, or spirits have been weakened or crushed. We pray for all of the people around the globe who have been newly diagnosed with COVID-19 as cases continue to rise in so many places. We pray for all those still struggling with long-term recovery from this virus and for all of the family and friends still mourning the loss of their loved ones. We pray for those facing diagnoses of other kinds, especially those that are chronic or life-threatening, and for those recovering from surgery or injury. Provide them with peace and fortitude as they adjust to a new normal, undergo treatments and wait for their bodies to heal. And we pray for those close to our hearts this day, for Jean, Carolyn, April, Claire and her family, Hal Crosswaite's family and friends as they honor his life this weekend, Nancy, and all those we name before you now. We lift up to your compassionate grace those whose burdens, guilt, or fears seem too massive to bear. This continues to be a season of deep emotional and mental strain, O Lord. Anxieties are running high and our inner reserves are running low. Financial resources grow scarce for so many and access to adequate health care has disappeared for millions along with their jobs. Send your peace and strength upon us all, but even more so to those bearing the extra weight of diagnosable mental illnesses or life-crushing addictions. We lift before your expansive mercy those whose hatred, rage, or vengeance cannot be contained. Shield all those who are at the receiving end of such anger and violence until such time as you can transform hardened hearts and change negative ways. Send your powerful peace to move among us until we can no longer resist its life-altering beauty and simply must amend our lives to reflect your just and loving ways. Receive all of our cares, loving God, and fill us with the light of Christ to lead us forward into the new life you desire for us, one far richer than the normal of our past that we still crave. Encourage us through the continual work of your spirit. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go in peace, be of good courage, and follow our Lord Jesus Christ if you dare. <laughs>